All right, I think we're ready to rumble. Uh, please welcome our esteemed panel, Somnath Biswas and Oksana Dambrowskite. Round of applause, please, for Som and Oksana. Both left their caps on the table over there. I thought that you'd both be, both be wearing them, but no pressure. <laughs> I'm only joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. Come here, come here. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, cool, so, so we've, heard, uh, we've heard a lot this morning. Should we get a quick photograph? Can we get a photograph here, Taras? Come on. Um, we've heard a lot this morning about... Uh... <laughs> come on, Tom. Right, that'll do. Impromptu, that's what it's all about. Uh, Cool. So we've heard a lot this morning about how businesses have been implementing conversational AI. Both of your organisations implementing it very successfully, um, and this, we're going to talk about ethics uh, at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of different areas of ethics that we can get into. There's kind of ethics from a kind of a global kind of like foundational technology point of view. You know, the likes of which the tool providers like Microsoft. OpenAI, Google, those that are providing the technology themselves have ethical considerations in building the technology and training the models and, and making it available and all that kind of stuff. But then there's another level down to that, which is the ethical use of the outputs of what they create, which is the kind of things that, that you're both kind of working on within your organization. So maybe, and we'll definitely turn it over, because I'd love to get some questions from, from people that are here and also those that are tuning in online. So if you do have any questions, uh, if you're watching online, get them into the Q&A and, uh, and we'll get to those. But I kind of wanted to just start by just opening an open question really, which is what are some of the kind of key ethical considerations that you both observe in either at the high level from the creation of the technology standpoint or from a more local level in terms of how you utilize the technology? Maybe Zoxana, we'll start with you. What are some of the kind of key ethical considerations of, of utilizing this technology in a, in a business context? Uh, I think the biggest consideration was uh, what's going to happen to people when AI actually comes. Because that's the biggest um, threat that businesses had at the beginning. Like, what are we going to do with people when uh, chatbots are there? AI is going to handle everything like in those sci-fi movies and uh, people see you later. Uh, but it's a bit of what I said also in my presentation. I, it's important to find the right balance between AI and human. And AI is actually good. This is what we understood in our organization. This is what our uh, employees understood too. Because uh, we use AI a lot for, not I would not say basic tasks with GPT-4 and all of that. It's more than basic. But it allows humans to do something different with more added values, something more interesting. So our employees now actually like it. But that was one of the biggest concerns that we had. Mm. And did that manifest itself? in terms of the concerns around job losses and stuff like that, is that actually an impact or actually is it being more that people have got more time and space to, to do other things or like what has the actual impact been sort of thing? Uh, so we never fired people when we automated all of that. So as I said, 50% of automated contacts, but we kept the same team and it just allows us uh, to use people to do something different, as you said. Yeah, it's funny because I remember working in, in government uh, seemingly many moons ago now and we were working on creating just online digital services on the web and, and mobile and stuff like that. And we were working with a bunch of different departments and for the first time they were putting services online that were traditionally done over the phone or via email. And when we introduced the, the first kind of wave of, of online services, the demand just shot through the roof. And the concern was that we're gonna kind of, you know, automate and all this kind of stuff, we're gonna lose our jobs, we're gonna lose the team and stuff like that. So it's all kind of stuff that's come back around, but the adoption went through the roof and then the digital channel was then blamed for creating more adoption. Whereas actually what was happening is that the, the demand was there, yeah. it's just that there was no way of absorbing it. And yeah. so the digital channel absorbed that demand, which then for the business and for the teams was far better because they're able to do their jobs more effectively and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I don't know if you've got any, any thoughts on that, Sam? For us, it was, um, it, it's kind of slightly different as well because there are uh, two aspects. One, there is an element of uh, regulatory and then there's an element of just being, you know, uh, from a user experience perspective. So I'll give you an example. So we were kind of working with one of the models and uh, we were trying out one use case where it was supposed to kind of, the user kind of gave a response and we said, okay, uh, tell us what the ideal response should be. And here in this case, the user was, was, uh, was a lady, but it kind of came back with a response where it generated and it was basically a male and the name was basically typical of a, you know, a white male kind of thing. So there's a bias that is already built in the model in terms of the data that exists. 
and especially when you, so whilst yes, there is going to be something that is going to come in from OpenAI or Microsoft or Google, but when you as an enterprise are providing this service to your end users, the onus is at that point of time on you to ensure that these biases kind of get a caught and then we are kind of, then you're kind of ensuring that those bias elements are reduced. So that was one aspect in terms of just ensuring fairness. We are kind of putting a few um, uh, measures in place for that in terms of at any point of time when there is an output that is being put out, we are kind of basically going to detect for bias around it. The second aspect was, um, uh, and this is probably to do with uh, the regulatory aspect that is going to come in. So I don't know if, um, especially from a recruitment perspective, there's a New York law for algorithmic uh, recruitment that is going to be in place sometime in 2023. And then most of you might have heard of the EU AI Act that was supposed to kind of get finalized last year and then chat GPT happened and now it's kind of the draft is going to come out at the end of this year with probably effect in 2025. From that perspective, there's an element of auditability that becomes a mandatory task, which we would anyways kind of do it. So from an uh, um, auditability perspective, purely as a product uh, person, there are two things that you need to kind of put in place. One, obviously there's an element where as a part of your ML ops, you have anyways you would do that for data drift in, in kind of any ML model, but now purely from a content perspective, you're trying to kind of put in this audits in place. The second is the element of explainability in terms of why did it kind of give this response. And so now that we are kind of working with the large language models, we are kind of using chain of thought models for that so that there's an element of explanation in terms of this is how we arrived at. So there are, um, it's, I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's a responsibility that kind of you have to your users. There's obviously an added responsibility that is going to come in from a regulatory perspective, but um, it is front and center. It is front and center. We've kind of now been working with, uh, we've been working with the Oxford Internet Institute for auditability uh, for probably I think a year plus now. So it's, it's, it is a key, as a product person, it's a key aspect that you have to build in in your product and build in in your operations. And from that kind of transparency and explainability perspective, it's probably easy enough with a, a more kind of traditional language model, so to speak, you know, because you can understand why it's classified this intent as such. When it comes to the large language models that a lot of people are experimenting with now, um, <laughs> I was having this conversation yesterday, which is that, like, I'm not co entirely convinced that the likes of OpenAI, Cohere, AI21, like these large language model providers, I'm not entirely convinced that they can actually specifically say why something happened with 175 billion parameters. How do you know which cluster of parameters have been responsible for which kind of weighting in terms of, you know, the, the, the kind of outputs and stuff like that? So, well, you mentioned their chain of, chain of thought reason. I wonder if you can explain a little bit about, yes. like, so how you can, how someone experimenting with large language models yeah. could, Im implement some degree of kind of explainability into what they're, what sure. they're doing? So again, uh, uh, I mean, uh, disclaimer, we are also kind of experimenting with chain of thought models as it's a fairly uh, new concept to us. But ultimately, uh, when you're kind of, so we are using chain of thought along with uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo here. And uh, ultimately what you're trying to do is basically instead of it straight away jumping and giving you the, the result by, uh, by way of chain of thought, it is basically saying, okay, I've got this, this is the input, this is what my, my, um, out, this is what my current position is, and so what is my next step, and then there's a response. So for this information, do I go down this route, or do, should I basically choose this, and then it says, okay, based on these factors, this is the response I've chosen, and then you're going with that. So from, whilst it might not, um, it will not give you a guarantee that it'll pick the right response, but it kind of gives you an element of auditability in terms of these were the options, and this is what it kind of went, went down. So chain of thoughts is basically, again, uh, this is kind of, uh, these are standard, uh, you know, uh, open source models that are available. There are multiple, uh, you know, uh, avenues for that. So when, especially for us, whilst working with GPT-3 and this thing, because of the large language model and the unknown uh, nature of it, uh, we've started, we actually started over chain of thought with a different idea because we, we need to kind of decide whether this response kind of comes in from uh, from a knowledge base or from the back end. So it would basically say, okay, someone says this, 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 at that point of time it'll say, do I need, need a tool for this? If, I, if so, I'm gonna call this API and do that. So that's how we started with the chain of thought, but from an auditability perspective, it's kind of given us that, uh, that view as well. So early days, but I think these might be the ways that you can, uh, that'll help you with the auditability. Mm. And 
we mentioned transparency and explainability and stuff like that. And when it comes to like privacy, Oksana, you were saying there, being able to kind of tie together a chat conversation and marry that together when someone comes in store. There's, there's tools out there which essentially will do things like put a tracker on the website and so that every phone number that you see on the website will be unique to your browsing session. And then when you call the contact center, the contact center have visibility over your current activity, what you've been searching for, what pages you're on, uh, what pages you were on when you called. And so there's a whole load of other contexts that can be kind of brought into, into this kind of stuff. With it, with the, there's a point where we may get into the kind of land of, hold on, how did you know I was on that page? Like, how did you know I was searching for that? Like, what's going on? So like, how, how, how are you approaching kind of, one is the transparency side of it, which is letting customers know what's actually being tracked and what the data's being used for, but also from the kind of back end in making sure that that kind of data is being kind of used securely and that it's not being tampered with or not being used for purposes that it's not being gathered for. Like, I wonder if you can share a little bit of thoughts in terms of your process and how you approach the whole kind of concept of privacy and security. Uh, it's definitely an interesting topic because uh, we used to use the chat before, um, before using our current solution. And it was very interesting because you could take control of customers' uh, screen in the basket and you could help them buy, basically. Oh my God, people used to freak out so much. Even we were asking them, can we take control of your screen? Uh, you are struggling to enter the postcode, for example. We see uh, we can help you out. Oh, it was creating so much panic. People were asking, how are you doing that? You are inside of my computer. It is illegal and all of this. Uh, it was funny, but not that funny. So from there, <laughs> for customers, it was not. Uh, from there, uh, we are really careful on how we explain to customers what is actually, uh, what, is, what can we actually do. So in this kind of scenario, we would very carefully introduce the topic to them. So first we would ask, we would see you are struggling do you need any help? They would say, yes, of course, we need help. And then, uh, if you don't mind, we will take control of your screen. We cannot access any of your device. It is all done through connection virtually. Uh, so it is absolutely safe. Your data is safe. And then, because we don't have auto replies on that, it's human explaining. People are more confident with that. We do have uh, messages about data security and all of that on the website as well, available also on the bot if uh, customer types data protection, they will see certain things. But I think it's important that agents are also able to explain it in a very, very just user-friendly way, human to human, so customers understand that you are there and uh, that it's it's just simple and that their data is secure. In Decathlon, we take data security very seriously because we are in more than 60 countries. It's very, very important for us because the database is very, very uh, large. Uh, so we ensure that whenever we uh, sign a contract with the new provider, first thing we check, even without any uh, connectivity or if the APIs are gonna be able to connect or whatever, is the data protection. It's the first thing that the legal team is checking. Are, we, are the suppliers compliant with our rules? And the rules that we have are quite strict. That's why we filter out a lot of suppliers as well. Uh, but it's really important for us that our customers' data is secure. What's your thoughts in terms of how you approach the both privacy on the, the, and transparency on the front end, and then also the security and privacy side of things on, on the back yeah. end in terms of where the data is going? So maybe, maybe I'll talk about the back end first, because I think the front end is very similar to what, what uh, Oksana mentioned. But from a back-end perspective, even when we were kind of, forget the large language model, even when we were kind of talking about using um, uh, Microsoft Lewis, um, these, these uh, vendors would actually allow you, there's a toggle which kind of says, don't train your model on my data. So that is essentially what we kind of started off with. Now OpenAI is also kind of allowing for that. So that's one of the first things we kind of do in terms of ensuring that whilst we are kind of benefiting from the model, but we are not passing on any information from our conversations to the model for them to kind of get trained. So that's one. Second is uh, what we do is um, even, so we have conversational designers and we're kind of obviously constantly auditing from a quality perspective, but uh, the interface that we built, we kind of obfuscate any PI information. So all names, any specific data kind of gets uh, uh, gets hidden, and then when the, when the designer is kind of going through that, it's basically that much more um, secure from that perspective. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, from, a, from a, again, pre-op product perspective, these are specific measures that, we, that you will kind of put in place to ensure that the customer feels comfortable kind of giving any information to you. 
when it comes down to the front end side of thing i think it's a balance because there's a fine balance being between being a stalker and personalizing it so you can basically if you can explain it properly in terms of this is the benefit that we are getting so so i know the last search you kind of did this is this still what you're looking for it's different from okay you know how did you know that i was on this page etc for us it's an added challenge because we kind of we we start off with the conversations on the web but we also have the whatsapp retargeting so there's an element of connectedness over there so we kind of start off with based on your last web search blah 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 we think this is a good thing for you so if you can explain the context that is there and then again you have to kind of pare down if you are kind of if your csr is falling if you are kind of getting those things then it's again a you you kind of have to see which needle is moving and then accordingly kind of balance it out absolutely i will give it uh, over to people if anyone has any questions we don't have any questions online if you do have some questions uh, if you're tuning in online feel free to stick them in the q and a anyone in the audience have any questions for for our panel regarding ethical considerations in in the application of conversational ai no have a think i'll ask you again in a moment um one of the things you mentioned there in terms of the um the tooling getting a little bit more sophisticated from the point of view of of this kind of of this stuff and you mentioned there that the Microsoft uh, having the ability to say don't train your models on this data for example um and there's some really good tools that will scrub out PII data and stuff like that however in some conversations part of what you need to do is actually kind of use that personally identifiable information to either authenticate someone or to look up something in a in a in a system or something like that and large language models are, are proving to be at least in our research relatively competent at extracting entities yeah. from an utterance reference numbers names addresses all that yeah. kind of stuff and so how do you kind of approach needing to use these kind of tools uh, where you really don't have much control over where the data is going and you know if you throw something at gpt3 you have no idea where the data is going and where it's been kind of you know if it's been used and stuff like that so although the technology has real promise how do you approach using it from you know to get the value from it whilst doing that kind of responsibly sort of thing i don't know oxana if you've got any any thoughts on that uh, it's a tricky question because it's very new technology and obviously it has a lot of capacity but to use it to the full capacity the same as everything it needs uh, data so i think here um, it's not the fact of gpt3 or gpt4 any tool that you connect to uh, where you share your customers data it's important that it is secure we are talking about chatbots here but it's the same with anything that you connect to if you connect to your order management system whatever it is gpt3 gpt4 or or any other tool you give access to all your customers data the question is where the data is going uh, after and this is what is uh, quite tricky because i think in front of our customers we are responsible for their data they leave data in my case on my website so if something happens i am liable for that and it's my responsibility to ensure where that data is going uh after with uh, the new technology yes it's very very complicated so it's about balance do you want to automate more yes you do how to do it in a secure way today i think there is no right or wrong answer because really we don't control where they send the data but i think it's going to evolve very very soon uh, because the more we use this uh, the more it common it will be everyone will have the same concern and surely something is going to have to come up where either it will be a legal constraints which partially already exist or you will put it inside of the contract i don't know what it will be uh, it's an open question today but something will come up today that technology is new tomorrow it will be something that everybody will use so surely it will evolve a lot any other thoughts it's, on that it's it's again it's probably building on the same line so for instance again i'll i'll talk I'll take a specific example so um uh microsoft kind of azure uh, they allow open ai services through the azure setup and the one advantage you probably have over microsoft as opposed to using directly through open ai at least for now is with open ai uh, you don't know where they they've not been clear about where they are storing the data with uh, azure we we know that there is a clear this thing saying it's being stored within the eu domain so from a um, you know data privacy perspective gdpr perspective there is an assurance that you would kind of get from that equally as you mentioned uh, even with the kind of uh, contracts that you would have with microsoft etc there are these are 
guardrails are put in place in terms of from a data privacy perspective. So that's some aspect, as uh, Oksana rightly mentioned, any kind of uh, third party service that you're using, whether it's a bot or something where any information is being shared, you already have some you know uh, frameworks in place. So you're kind of building on that, but you have to be extra conscious about that. The other part of it is uh, obviously you're kind of, you could go down the route of um, just to kind of train up the models, you could just use synthetic data to kind of train up the models and then use it and then you can basically have uh, places where you're kind of owning the models as well. But that's a very costly thing, it's, there are a number of unknowns around it, so there's again a fine balance. But for now you're kind of falling back on the uh, tools and the measures that you have in place anyways from a contract perspective to kind of ensure that you are, you know, you know, your, you know your data privacy is pivotal anyways, so you're kind of making sure everything is there. It's a very, very good question, actually, because uh, we can check, example, a bit away of chatbots. Look at Google Pay and Apple Pay, right? Uh, Google and Apple today have loads of our data. Before, uh, we have customers, we have examples on the website. People were not confident to use it because they were like, okay, I'm going to save my details somewhere. Who knows where that is going? Google is already big. Uh, they will have even my credit card information. Uh, what is that? And today, uh, we it's in our everyday life, so we got used to that, and it is pretty much clear for everyone. People know that they can trust Google. They know that they can trust Apple. The same will surely happen at some point with technology like GPT-3, GPT-4, GPT-25, probably in the future. It just takes a bit of time, and it will become more structured. I really believe in that. Fantastic. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, give a round of applause, please, for Oksana Dambowski and Sonia Fizwas.